and I kind of went over this, some of this already. Area 0, also known as the backbone area, connects all the other networks. If your network only has one area, it will always be the area 0. Uh, area connecting only to Areas only connecting to area 0 are referred to as stub areas. So, um, you know, back here, these networks aren't like, you know, connecting each other somewhere right in here. You don't have a network right here, so these are technically uh, stub areas. Okay, so OSPF metrics. Um, OSPF uses cost as the metric in which uh, lower cost paths are preferred. So lower numbers are better as far as determining best route. Um, the cost is actually calculated by taking 10 to the 8th and dividing that by the link bandwidth. Um, and so, you know, based on that, you got a table here of some of your, your possible values for common, um, common bandwidth speeds on different links. So uh, 10 to the 8th, I think that is uh, 100 million. So 100 million divided by 56,000, you're going to get 1785, and so on and so forth. Um, kind of one kind of shortfall on OSPF is that once you get into um, links that are fast enough, where the the OSPF becomes one. So for instance, you're taking 100 million, you're dividing it by, in this case, for fast Ethernet, it's 100 megabits per second or 100 million. So it's going to you know divide into one. Well, if you go up beyond that, you know, in this case, you're dividing 100 million d divided by uh, 1 billion. You're still going to uh, set that cost as one because you're not going to have, um, you know, it's always going to be an integer value. So uh, there's there's some stuff you can do within OSPF to specifically configure uh, interfaces that are faster than, you know, fast Ethernet, gigabit, and Ethernet, th that kind of range specifically configure them to carry a different cost so that it can um, it can calculate the the path easier but um, just keep this in mind like if you haven't specifically configured that like once you get to about fast ethernet and beyond the OSPF cost is always going to be one because you can't divide this into smaller numbers in that um, so OSPF routers are known by their unique 32-bit router IDs um, that 32-bit router ID is, is going to be based on an IP address so what it first prefers is the highest IP assigned to an active logical interface. A logical interface means it's, it's not a physical interface. Um, it's, it's only logical. So in most cases, it's going to be a loopback address. Um, so you know, if you're trying, you've got a particular router, it's got a you know, loopback zero. That's the only loopback on there. It's the only logical um, interface. Whatever the IP of that uh, loopback is going to be your router ID. Um, if you've got a, a situation where no logical interfaces are present, it uses the highest IP address of an active physical interface. So if for whatever reason you do not have a loopback or another logical interface configured on that router, it's going to look at all your, your physical interfaces and whichever one has the highest IP address, you know, the counting up the number wise, is going to be um, your router ID. With OSPF, it is highly, highly, highly recommended that you always configure a logical interface uh, that you know is going to be your, your router ID. Um, one reason is that if you if you let it be a physical interface and that physical interface goes down for some reason, even if the router has other interconnections to the network, it's no longer going to participate in OSPF because its router ID is no longer present on the network. A loopback address the only time it's going to go into a down state is if you manually shut it. So like if you if you create, you know, go into config t interface loopback 0 IP address, you know, 10.0.0.1 255.255.255.255 unless you specifically shut it down, it's always going to be in an up state. You don't have to unshut it like you or no shut it like you do a uh, a regular physical interface. Um, so and you know, a loopback address usually it's just going to be a single IP, so it's going to be a slash thirty two. So that subnet mask is always going to be all two five fives across. So make sure you have at least one loopback address or logical interface uh, configured on each router participating in OSPF, so you always know the router ID. Um, on topologies, uh, the hello and dead timers, our neighbor discovery, and OSPF update overhead reduction are all impacted by whatever kind of topology type you have there. So um, this is basically, you know, how frequently it has to send out hel the hello messages and how long until it considers a router dead if it doesn't receive those hello messages from it. So for network topologies that are broadcast multi-access in which, you know, broadcasts and multicasts are heard by all devices such as Ethernet, the, uh, the times are 10 seconds for hello, 40 seconds for dead. So you miss four hellos, you're, you're considered dead, and they, they wipe that information from their... Um, 
the routing tables. So, but for non-broadcast multi-access, sometimes referred to as NBMA, uh, similar to broadcast multi-access where devices share a medium, but devices cannot hear each other's broadcast uh, messages, such as you know, frame relay is a perfect example of this. The, uh, the time for hellos is actually bumped up to 30 seconds, and after you miss uh, four of those, at 120 seconds, the router is considered dead. For point-to-point -point topologies, where you've only got two devices and they're directly connected to each other on a shared link, um, it's the same as it is for uh, non-broadcast multi-access, where you got 10 second hellos, four of those you miss, 40 seconds, you're dead. <clears throat> so uh, DR and BDR election, the designated router and the backup designated router. A designated router, or DR, and a backup designated router, BDR, are elected for each area uh, we, you know, we talked about the specific areas broken up on our network, are elected for each area on broadcast multi-access and non-broadcast multi-access networks to control flooding of link state changes. When a link fails, only the designated router is updated, which is then solely responsible for updating the other routers on the network. The, uh, the DRBDR listens on multicast address 22, uh, 224.0.0.6, all routers in the area listen on 224.0.0.5. Both of those are, are multicast addresses. So basically what this is saying is you've got you've got an area and you've got, let's say you got 15 routers in there. When you get a lot of routers in there, if a if a topology change happens, you know, it, you might get a flood of updates as a result of that. By having a DR and BDR, you limit the number, uh, you limit the amount of just like chatter going on in the network by keeping those um, those multicast um, advertisements to a minimum. So what happens is if a you know if a router anywhere in that network in that area of an OSPF network goes down, instead of just you know telling that to every single router around it, it only tells that to the 224.0.0.6 multicast address, which only the DR and BDR are listening to. Once they, once the designated router hears that message, then it subsequently um, advertises that out to all the routers on the network via the 224.0.0.5, rather than having every router in the area just uh, slamming that out to every single other router. So it, it basically reduces the amount of just information going back and forth for those updates. And so this is, you know, kind of a, a quick example of that. You know, say you've got, um, you know, router A is your, uh, your your designated router. This link to router B goes down. It's going to send a message to A to tell it that that link went down. A is going to subsequently tell each of these individual routers that uh, that link went down rather than having this just spam it out to every, you know, rather than having router B spam this out to every router and then every router subsequently spamming that same message out to every router. Um, you've just got, you know, two instances of that happening. <clears throat> 